Welcome back. N Next, we'd like to welcome the man with arguably the hardest job in the world. We're incredibly excited to be joined by Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, Director General of the World Health Organization, former Health Minister, of course, and Foreign Minister of Ethiopia. Dr. Tedros is the first African to head the World Health Organization. He has the unenviable task of balancing public health and global politics as the world fights the worst pandemic in a hundred years. He's going to give a short address that'll be followed by a conversation with me, David Pilling, and questions from you, the audience. So do get ready to participate using the chat function on the right of your screen. Dr. Tedros, welcome. Thank you, thank you, David. Thank you for having me and very nice to see you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Tedros. <laughs> So if, if, if you begin with your address, and then uh, I think you have a, 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 some, some words you'd like to say, and then I will, uh, I will begin to ask you some questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you again, David. Esteemed colleagues, uh, friends and colleagues uh, and guests, it's an honor to join you today. The COVID-19 pandemic is an event such as we have not seen in a century. It's affecting every country and every sector. Currently, cases and deaths are increasing in the Americas, Asia, and the Middle East. One of the few encouraging trends is in Africa, which has been less affected than other regions and is now the only region where cases are not increasing. The current downward trend is cause for optimism. However, in the last few weeks, we have been seeing worrisome increases in cases and deaths in some countries. Just as with the rest of the world, Africa must remain vigilant with this virus. Like a forest fire, a small spark can set off a raging blaze. Africa's long experience responding to infectious diseases means that a number of countries already have the expertise laboratory infrastructure, and networks of community health workers that are critical for containing COVID-19. Testing is critical. Many African countries have increased testing, but there are still problems with access to testing kits. The WHO is working with partners to fill those gaps. Over the past few months, we have shipped millions of test kits and tons of protective equipment to many countries in Africa and train thousands of health workers. We will soon be able to make 120 million new rapid tests available to low and middle income countries. While we maintain the momentum fighting COVID-19, we cannot ignore the large scale inequalities that are putting lives and livelihoods at risk. The pandemic has many impacts beyond the disease itself disrupting essential health services, such as those for maternal, child health, and chronic conditions like hypertension. Critical immunization programs have also been suspended, putting tens of millions of children at risk. We must also be conscious that heavy-handed responses can cause unintentional harm. Prolonged lockdowns can badly disrupt lives and livelihoods for already vulnerable populations, including exacerbating hunger. Responding to the pandemic is not a job for the health sector alone. It requires engagement across government and society. The impact of this novel virus has gone far beyond the health sector, causing economic, political, and societal disruption. The International Monetary Fund predicts that the economy in Sub-Saharan Africa will contract by 3.2% this year, the worst on record. We know that many businesses have been profoundly affected. I join the call to the international community and international financial institutions to consider measures such as debt relief or restructuring to enable poorer countries to ease the adjustment of their public finances so that health and other social spending can be sustained. It is especially important that the private sector, which provides more than 30% of healthcare in Africa, 
play a leading role both in responding to the pandemic and in the recovery. Private sector engagement in the COVID-19 response in the region so far has ranged from renovating isolation centers in the Gambia to providing financial contributions to the African Strategies Response Plan. Personally, I have been impressed by the way many African nations and entrepreneurs have redirected industrial capacity to produce personal protective equipment and other commodities such as ventilators. Local production is not only a way to ensure a more reliable supply of life-saving products, it also contributes to economic development. Equally important is creating a sound and conducive regulatory environment. Region-wide initiatives such as the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement and Africa Medicines Agency Treaty along with the strong African Union are critical to success on the road ahead. Since the beginning of the pandemic, WHO has worked closely with the Africa CDC and we will continue to do so. COVID-19 is only one threat that the people of Africa and the people of the world face on a daily basis. Although our efforts are rightly focused on responding to this crisis, we must also learn the lesson it's teaching us that health is not a luxury item or a reward for development. Strong health systems and health security are two sides of the same coin. When people have access to quality, affordable prevention and treatment services, businesses and economies can flourish. Universal health coverage based on primary health care is the foundation of health security, stability, and sustainability. Achieving universal health coverage requires investments in health systems, especially in strong primary health care, with an emphasis on promoting health and preventing disease. Ultimately, strong, resilient health systems are the best defense against every health emergency from the personal crisis of a stroke to a global pandemic. Health is a right for all people, not a privilege for those who can afford it. This is at the heart of WHO's work and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Dear colleagues and friends, let me leave you with a few requests. As Desmond Tutu said, I quote, my humanity is bound up in yours for we can only be human together, end of quote. We need more than signs to confront the pandemic. We need national unity and global solidarity. So first, find a way to contribute to ending this pandemic. We ask those of you with local production capacity for vaccines and therapeutics to be ready to rapidly scale up production to ensure access, or if your business is outside this domain, you can invest in it. You can also support the response with in-kind contributions and financially through the Solidarity Response Fund and the WHO Foundation. Second, use your influence. Business leaders are thought leaders. They can accomplish a great deal by staying informed and speaking clearly about the measures that businesses government and communities can take to prevent the spread of the disease. Finally, set an ex example. Invest in workplace safety measures for your workers and workplace. Work with members of the business community to put in place preparedness measures and plans for business continuity. Saving lives and protecting livelihoods are complementary goals. That means investing in health and innovation, growing the knowledge economy, and building on the potential of Africa's young workforce through skills building. My friends, your partnership is essential, not only for defeating this pandemic, but for building the healthier, safer, and fairer world we all want. I thank you. Thank you, David, again. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for those words.
Um, there's quite a lot to get through, so I'm going to um, sort of ask you um, quite a few questions. First of all, I think it's fair to say that Africa has done better than expected in terms of the actual health crisis. Um, a number of kind of theories have been advanced, the, the, the young age, possible cross immunity. Of course, African policy has also been pretty good and you know, a lot of African governments acted quite early. Is it fair to say that you've been surprised um, uh, at the course of the pandemic in Africa? And what do you think explains it? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, the many countries, including developed countries especially, were surprised by this pandemic. And in some countries, you, you, you can see its impact very, very serious. So comparing to the surprises of the, um, the developed countries, then expecting uh, some serious conditions in Africa was not uh, easy. I mean, was not um, was the right thing to do. So we were surprised actually that how uh, Africa did it. But after uh, we have seen the situation, and as you rightly said, understanding the situation in Africa, uh, then uh, there were things that could, could explain it. Uh, but of course, um, comparing what happened in other parts of the world, especially in developed countries, I mean, our expectation in Africa was really for the worst. But Africa, I think, did uh, better, better than expected. As you say, infection rates are now going down, uh, even in South Africa, which is re responsible, maybe the wrong word, but which accounts for nearly half of the deaths, uh, the COVID deaths so far on the, on the continent. Um, but now that, you know, we seem to be over that hump, how should African economies go, go around lifting restrictions, opening their borders to investors um, and tourists? to get their economies going without triggering um, what has come to be known, especially in Europe, as a, as a second wave? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there are four things we're recommending to all countries, actually. Um, and these are, one, I think the amplif uh, avoiding the ampl amplifying events is very important. Uh, if you see many countries, even the early days, if you take Korea, um, all started in a place of worship where people gathered. And then if you take uh, the situation, how it started in, in Italy, it was actually a stadium. So managing amplifying effort, e e events is very, very important. If possible, avoiding the stadiums, places of worship, uh, other gatherings, nightclubs, and so on. And the second uh, thing that African countries uh, should do is um, mobilizing the community uh, to do its, its, its share. Um, you know, without community involvement, it cannot succeed. So the masks, the physical distance, and other things that we advise individuals to do should be, should be done. And governments should continue uh, also testing. That's the third one testing, identifying cases, identifying clusters, and addressing them as quickly as, as possible. And the number four is, as you know, deaths are high in elderly uh, people, senior citizens, uh, people with underlying health conditions, uh, and so on. So uh, giving attention and protecting those vulnerable groups is number four. If we can do this four, I think businesses can open and also uh, the in, in economy can get back to, to normal. Of course, at the same time, while investing in vaccines that can give us an added value for faster economic uh, recovery. Now, I want to concentrate on Africa in this discussion, but I just want to ask you one question about the rest of the world, where we're seeing what appears to be the pandemic kind of spiraling out of control in, in some countries. And how does this end? And when does this end, in your opinion? Uh, you know, if you, if you compare the, uh, the you know, situation between countries, 
um, in some countries, there is success in controlling it and in, in managing it. In others, you know, there is a problem, as you rightly said. Um, if you take countries, for instance, in, in Asia, uh, they have managed to control it. And the four things which I have said are the reason uh, behind managing and, and, and controlling it. If you see the overall distribution of the pandemic, I know you know that 10 countries are contributing more than 70% of the cases and deaths. Actually, more countries are doing better than, than you know, those countries, less number of countries uh, who are not uh, doing, doing well. So what we advise is from WHO, um, the, the solution is there in our hands. We have already proven tools. Those countries who have managed or controlled the pandemic are using those tools. So if those countries who have um, a serious transmission, community transmission, can use those tools, they can still manage and control it like those uh, other countries who have, who have done so. So my answer is we have the tools at hand. Can I pin you down and, and, and get you to predict when we'll be able to look back and say that was the pandemic of 2020? You know, uh, we normally avoid uh, projections because, uh, you know, it's very difficult to, to project because from what we have seen so far, the outcome depends on how the country actually does, meaning it's in our hands. So what I can tell you uh, is since this is in our hands, it depends on how well we use the tools we have. If we use the tools properly and effectively, we can end it soon. If we don't use the tools we have at hand properly, then it could linger with us, it could stay with us for a very long uh, period. So we have proven in many countries that this pandemic can be controlled. Many countries actually. If you start from countries even neighboring China, Many countries neighboring China that we thought would be affected more have managed to control it. Start from Japan, Korea, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, New Zealand, Australia. Then you can come here also. In Africa, many countries. In Europe, the same. In Latin America. So we have the tools at hand, and each and every country should believe that by using the tools, the four which I have outlined, it can actually, any country can manage and, uh, you know, uh, control the pandemic. Let me ask a question from the audience, and I'll sort of ask a supplementary one um, that goes along with it. And um, we're fortunate enough to have a question from John Kengasong, who has, of course, been leading the African response at Africa CDC in, in Addis Ababa. He says, given the experience so far observed in the present response to COVID-19, um, how can Africa better prepare for a new pandemic? And if I could just add supplementary question. Um, does the WHO itself need strengthening? You know, after all, you've been criticized in a sense for soft peddling on, on China. There's been that criticism, but, but reasonably we know there's only so much that you can do. You're an international organization made up of nation states. Do you, does the WHO need more power itself um, to be able to um, mount surveillance operations to compel countries to give data, et cetera? So on, on the first one for Africa, I think um, to prepare for a, a new pandemic, number one, it should um, continue to invest in public health and in strengthening primary health care. Um, and then uh, the, the uh, second is supply chain. We, we have struggled at the initial stage. So strengthening supply chain is very important. And third, I think strengthening local production capacity for personal protective equipments and other uh, or pharmaceuticals will be very, very important. So African countries should take this uh, very, very seriously. And fourth, investing in health workers. Of course, 
improving the work environment they have now and strengthening their capacity, but at the same time, uh, recruiting uh, more uh, will be uh, very important. So these are the four areas I would I would I would uh, suggest, uh, and we're moving towards this, this direction. By the way, and we're working with Africa CDC as I as I told you. But I know uh, John, uh, can, uh, my friend, can say more 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 on this. Then on um, WHO. Uh, you know, change should be a constant. That's what we believe in WHO. Change is constant for us. And as soon as I became director general, we have started a transformation agenda. And we actually launched the um, transformation change or design uh, in March 2019, last year. And many of the components of the transformation actually were things related to strengthening the um, emergency preparedness capacity of the organization. And I think you know um, many of those. One, uh, we established the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board that the world is now uh, happy to see that they had already presented two reports and they have shown us how the world was, is unprepared even now. Then the second is a new division for emergency preparedness, which is up and running and helping many countries. And the science division and first ever uh, chief scientist for WHO, which is helping now with the research part and the trial, the solidarity trial for therapeutics and uh, that division is now moving into solid solidarity trial for vaccines. Data and um, Delivery is another division we, we, we have uh, established after this transformation. And last but not least, among other things, of course, I don't want to waste your time listing everything that we're trying to change, is a WHO Academy, which we're building now. And we have already um, enrolled a, a close to 5 million people and trained on uh, emergencies during in the middle of the pandemic. This is the first time actually we're training millions all over all over the world. So there has been transformation already that started. And now this pandemic is unprecedented. And we're trying to learn lessons from it. And we're incorporating it into the transformation agenda. And we have yeah. the uh, IPPR, the Independent Panel uh, for Pandemic Preparedness, the IHR review, and the Independence Oversight Advisory Committee also are doing assessments and the lessons we learned from that will also be incorporated to move WHO forward. So reform is, should be a constant and we will continue uh, to do that and WHO also needs constant, constant change. You also need multilateral backing or backing from you know, powerful countries. Do you feel as though that is lacking at the moment? Uh, it's not just backing, by the way. If you take the whole UN, it doesn't work without, uh, you know, uh, global leadership by the countries themselves, especially the major powers, should work together and lead. The UN is more of facilitating, but the power is still in the hands of the countries themselves. So we have a sorry. So the, the lead, it's not about uh, actually. Uh, cooperating with the multilateral, but they should step up and 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 lead, which is not the case in this pandemic, as you said in the uh, in the opening, uh, yes. which is uh, uh, which is um, uh, causing the pandemic actually to uh, continue. Dr. Tedros, we have about fifty seconds left. We have uh, a question about a vaccine. When will we get a viable vaccine? Do you think? So. Um, by the end of this year or early next year, that's what we're uh, estimating now. And we have uh, good candidates. Dr. Tedros, thank you so much. We're so grateful for you uh, joining us um, today. There were many more questions I would have liked to have asked, um, but thank you so much. Um, thank you. Th th thank you so much. And I hope to, uh, hope to be able to meet in person one of these days. Thanks very thank much you, for joining Thank you, thank you, David. Thank you for having me and thank you for this opportunity. Much gratitude. Thank you, likewise. Thank you.